Yo, welcome to Hefe Talks. Before we begin, like, subscribe to YouTube channel. Content pretty much daily. We got a special guest, Eric McCollum. How you doing, my guy? Yeah, I'm doing good, man. I appreciate you having me on the show. So, where are you? You're in Spain right now? Yeah, it's we a- actually um, have uh, two Euro Cup games in Spain. So, you know, we're out here for about nine days or so. Well, first of all, I want to take it back. Where do you um where do you find your passion for the game growing up in um Canton, Ohio? I think um, most of it came from just our upbringing. Um, mm-hmm. You pretty much had to just be involved in extracurricular activities just to keep you busy, keep you out of trouble. You know, as a young kid, there's a lot of distractions in the inner city, so our parents thought it was best if we remained active. We'd have less time for mischief, so mm-hmm. we just started to pick up many different sports. We played everything. And um, basketball was something that we just drew the closest to. I think um, in high school is when I finally stopped playing like football, baseball, track, all that stuff. And I focused on basketball. I think baseball was my best sport and my brothers, but we liked it. We didn't love it. So you think you could have chased a um, professional baseball career? <laughs> Man, you were no, bucket like... in basketball. I don't know about that <laughs> shit. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm looking at the highlights. I don't know, man. <laughs> hey, I, I always laugh about it people always um ask us that and i i just say like literally like baseball was me and my brother's best sport like not close like we were we were we were very good um but who knows maybe we wouldn't have worked as hard in baseball because we didn't love it so you know yeah. who knows where we would be <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks well what, what height were you your freshman year at high school like um what what was your height because you said you were a late bloomer did yeah because i know i know like, year, i was i was five foot five you were five five two, so both you guys are short to begin. Yeah, CJ, CJ wow. was five two his freshman year. Like people don't know, but um, CJ's a year um, younger than his class, so okay. he started school early. Um, and my mom's intentions was just to hold him back and let him pl- like do it again, because I think at the time it was maybe it was free to go to like um, kindergarten and it like charged you or something for yeah. like half day school, like for a little kid. So she was like, "I'm just gonna start him in school early." And, um, you know, he'll probably struggle just because he's a year younger than everybody, but he didn't, he did well. And so the time came where all the AU coaches, like all the high school coaches like, yo, you should hold him back. Cause my brother graduated at age 17 and he said, no, he wanted to play with me because we have a three and a half year difference. So if he got held back, he would never been able to play with me. So I was five, five as a freshman. He was five, two, my sophomore year. Um, I grew to five, eight, um, his sophomore year, he was five, six. And then uh, my junior year, I was 5'10". His junior year, he went from 5'6 to 6 foot. Oh, and damn. Then, uh, my, <laughs> yeah, so he had a huge spread. And then my senior year, um, I was uh, 6 foot from 5'10 to 6 foot. And his senior year, he was 6'2". And literally, when he signed his letter of intent, you know, he was 6'2". I signed when I was 6 foot. By the time we went to college, we both grew two inches. I was 6'2 heading into college. And he was um, a little under 6'4 heading into college. Damn, damn, that's crazy. Y'all high school team was straight. Y'all had um, Costas, that's how you say it? Mm-hmm. He, was, yeah. he was on your high school team as well, right? I believe yeah, so. Yeah, Costa Kufis. He was mm-hmm. a McDonald's All-American. Uh, yeah. He was number two um, center in the nation behind Kevin Love. And, mm-hmm. you know, he was highly regarded, special player, special player. So we we had a really good team. We was um, one of the top teams in the state. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we did some damage. How was it like, um, you know, those early, like, battles? you know, like, um, growing up in high school. Cause I know like he, um, you know, you had a like big influence on him. And then you were also like, people will notice you were also a bucket too, you know, so <laughs> a lot of people will notice like the 82 game, 82 points you had on China. I was mm-hmm. watching that the other day. I just watched <laughs> all day. That's me. But, um, but back in high school, like what was kind of like those early battles? Cause it wasn't just him. Y'all had a loaded team. I know you guys yeah. were making each other better, but like, how was those early battles? Like, you you guys as a cohesive unit with your high school team? I mean, it was special just because, you know, everybody was always pushing each other to be better. Um, and also on that team, we had a 6'5", uh, three-man. And 6'5", yeah. 6'6", six, 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 we ended up going to school together in college. His name was Nate West. Nate West, So yeah. we, were, we were pretty big. We went 7'1", 6'6", 6'5", and then uh, six foot. And we had a guard that was about, uh, five nine five ten but he was you know a good distributor and basically mm-hmm. you know Costa kind of he he was the leader he was option one um, he was a seven foot one guy in the middle you know had a dirt and whiskey type of skill set and you know me him and CJ you know we're always together always working always training 
you know, trying to improve ourselves. And it's good because a lot of times on teams, it's easy to become complacent. But like with that type of team, it was like, who can be in the gym first? Yeah. Who's going to get more shots after? Like, I'm not leaving yet. He's not leaving. Like, oh, he's still in the gym. I'm going to be here too. And, and that was kind of just the mindset. And I think it's why us three had so much success, just because we were always not only supporting and uplifting each other, but we were competing to see who could put in the most work, who could be the hardest worker. And, and I think that's why you see um, you know, us thriving. I see Coast to have a 12 or 13 year NBA career. You know, I'm in my 12th season now. Um, my brother's in his ninth. And you know, I think that's something that just carries with you. If you have that work ethic and that spirit, even when you achieve your goals or you know, you become financially well, mm-hmm. you'll still work because that's all you know and also in high school did you guys work out with a particular trainer i know like um i always want to notice like uh your like development process because like each year in high school like you guys are like improving you weren't you were growing but like your game was like you know like improving each year but um like what did you guys have a particular trainer or y'all were just in a lab just like trying to take each other's heads (laughs) that's how me and my brother are yeah you know, yeah, so. we it's it's so different nowadays. Like we never had a trainer. One, it was too expensive. You know, mm. our family <laughs> could afford to, to pay for. Um, I feel it. I you feel know, it. us to have the necessities, what we needed. But mm. you know, a trainer like that was out the question. Like, I didn't even think that was possible. And then also too during that era, like trainers weren't as prevalent. It was such a big thing. Like now it's like mm. there's trainers left and right. There's like places for kids to go to work out. Everything like when we grew up, mm. it was just you just go outside and you just go hoop and. Mm. And you was just working on your game. And so what we did is, um, like, my, my mom and dad would buy, like, these videos, and they were called Better Basketball. And so I don't know if people remember, but, like, the yeah. slogan, Better Basketball. And we would literally <laughs> watch um, the videos, and then some of those drills we would steal, mm-hmm. and we would start to use it. And, like, at this time, like, you know, you're talking about, like, I'll be 34 in a couple of weeks. So, like, I'm probably mm-hmm. 10, 11, 12 years old. There was no YouTube. Like, mm-hmm. there was no Instagram. Mm-hmm. There was none of that. There wasn't Facebook um mm. <laughs> i don't even think myspace was around yet yeah. so like literally we're watching yeah. vhs videos and then eventually mm. it became dvds mm. and and we translate some of the stuff watching and then mostly we were just playing like all day non-stop mm. like and i think that's probably why there's maybe less injuries back in our air just because our we didn't have that wear and tear we didn't specialize early playing mm. one sport we played everything so your body was getting a break in different areas and we weren't mm. forced to go out there to go train at 10 years old like I see kids eight seven years old going to my trainer now like Mm -hmm. my first trainer was when I was a pro my (laughs) brother's first trainer was like his um maybe junior year of um college Mm -hmm. and then he only got it because like I I got one my second year as a pro so I was just like come on you can do it with me so I think um like we we just were kids that's why we, we were skinny but we loved the game we had fun and and no one forced us to go do anything. And, and when it's our choice, when it's, you know, a child's choice to just to choose their life, to choose what they want to do, I think um, that's when you get that enjoyment from it. I think too many kids are forced to do things, you know, early on. I think I think that's a different generation. So, yeah, they're skilled, but they're burnt out. They're tired, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and, and they're, they're at high risk for injury. We was just hooping 5 on 5, just playing. And then as we, you know, as time started to advance, YouTube started to come around. Certain things started to come around, like when we're getting into high school years. And mm-hmm. then we just would use stuff that we seen off the internet. And I'd go out there and I literally did all our training for me and my brother. And, and every year, you know, I would take something and I would learn something. I would advance. And then when I went to college, I took some of those workouts and then professional. And basically, I just tweaked it to where it could be beneficial to us and our game. Mm-hmm. Because there's no point in you training on something that you can't translate to the game or that you know, you can't be good at it. If you're a guy who's just a shooter, you know, you can work on stuff to improve, Mm -hmm. but your bread and butter is shooting. So you need to be Mm -hmm. working on all different types of shots. If you're a back to basket postman, yes, you can work on stuff to improve your game, but bread and butter needs to be how you get your money. You know, you need to perfect that. Once you perfect that, you can move on. So I think that's just kind of how I, how I did that. I knew we were small. So Mm -hmm. I knew we need to be able to shoot. We need to be fast. We need to have handle. We need to be quick. Mm -hmm. So, we worked on all that ball handling and shooting and being able to get your shot over bigger people. You know, after after high school, after graduating, you went to Goshen College. That's how you say it, mm-hmm. Goshen. You yep. went to you're the all time um, leading scorer there. Yes, uh, at, at, at Goshen College. Um, 
what made you go there? Did you have any other like choices that you wanted or you just wanted to go somewhere? So for me, I wanted to um, play division one. That was always my goal. And mm. I didn't really play AAU. And that's what really hurt me because I mm. wasn't able to really be on the scene. And I should have played AAU, but I didn't know better. Like at that time, you know, I didn't have nobody to kind of lay that blueprint. So, mm. you know, through that air, um, I think I was a little bit under guarded, um, under the radar. And um, when I was getting recruited, um, I had one division one offer, but it was contingent upon a kid um, who had committed like a sophomore year. Yeah. So it was on um, Tennessee tech. He had committed a sophomore year, but he just hadn't didn't have the ACT score. Mm -hmm. And so he had took the test two or three times and he had failed every time. And so mm -hmm. the coach was like, look, we have to honor this kid's scholarship if he passes it because he's committed to us early. Mm -hmm. But if he doesn't, the offer's yours. We really want you. We only have one scholarship available mm -hmm. uh, depending on his situation. Mm. and then you know at the time you know i'm this is bad but like i'm over there like praying and hoping this kid fail i don't even know who it is to this day <laughs> yeah. but uh fast forward <laughs> he ended up passing his act Dang. and um and there was i'm stuck scrambling and so now i only have schools who want me to walk on and, and i don't want a college debt you know i don't want college to be on my plate or on my parents plate and i think it's stupid at least for me how i was thinking to to go to a school to walk on and pay when I got division two schools, NAI schools, all these schools offer me a free education and I'll be debt free. So for me, it was a no brainer. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to go division one, but sometimes in life, there's a detour you got to take, you got to make the best of it. And so I was like, I'm gonna I'm go to a school that has a good education. And Goshen College um, is a top 10 academic Christian institution. Um, so that was enticing to me. Um, they have a great job placement after a graduation um and with good salaries and um it was away from home i wanted to get away from home away from distractions you know i wanted to kind of see something else i had been in one area my whole life i wanted to see what else was out there so i was walking into it with my number yeah. um, my position it was my spot to lose and like i was yeah. like the most highly regarded recruit they ever had so like i go from always being under the radar to like now i guess i'm a big fish mm. in a small pond and if you a killer, they're going to find you no matter where you are. And, mm -hmm. and I think that was crucial that I was able to play right away. I was able to play through mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to be featured, all that stuff. And so, like, you know, I have a son. And if he decides to play sports, you know, I'm going to always tell him, go where you can play. Like, mm -hmm. it's not about the biggest offer. It's not about the best facilities. You know, if you put the work in and mm -hmm. the platform will be there. Like, I don't care what school. I mean, you see it now. You got John Morant. You know, mm -hmm. small school. My brother went to Lehigh, Dane, went to mm -hmm. Lieber. Mm -hmm. um, Paul George was at what, Fresno. Mm -hmm. um, like, so many guys. Steph Davidson. Like, if you're mm -hmm. good enough and you put the work and you dominate, they will find you. How'd you feel like your senior year when you, it was your final year in college? And because you had a dominant like career, like, I think, did you score like 2,000 total points, I think, or something like that? A, li a little under 2,800. A little over, like, <laughs> <laughs> I humbled it. You see what I'm saying? So you were wilding out there, but like, um, like how was it that final year where you like, damn, like, you know, or and did you ever consider transferring? Because you had numbers to go. Yeah. You know, if you wanted to go D1, you could. But I, when I was looking at it, I was like, I mean, you stay four years there, you have to like it. You know what I'm saying? Especially when you know you can go D1. So like, what made you want to do that? So for me, I like I like the people. Uh, I had a really good team. I still to this day, I got some lifelong friends in there. I mean, you know how it is when you go to college, like you develop these bonds. Um, mm. You're living with these guys, you're getting to know them in and out. And there's some of them I can depend on to this day. Mm. And so I started to really love the people. Um, and the first and foremost, number one reason I go to college is to get a degree. Mm. And that was number one for me. Like I, I was like one of the first people in, the, in my family to graduate, to get a degree. Sometimes when you transfer, sometimes all your credits don't transfer over Sometimes you got to worry about fit, all those things. And back in that year, um, if you transfer, you had to sit out a year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had schools that wanted me to come and wanted me to play. And I was just thinking, like, I was a good student. Yes, I was, like, National Honor Society, all that stuff in high school, like, three seven, three eight, whatever. And then in college, I was a good student. But that didn't necessarily mean I wanted to spend extra years in school. Like, my, mind, and my <laughs> mindset was, like, I went to my counselor and I said, I need to be out of here in four years because that's how long my scholarship is. I need to be out of here in four years with my degree. Mm -hmm. Give me all the credit courses, all the classes I need to get out of here. And they were mm -hmm. like, well, that's a heavy course load. I said, no, 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 no. 
four years. I'm out. I'm not paying a dollar and I'm not staying here one more second than I have to be. And it's not that I didn't like the experience in school. I loved it. I loved yeah. the environment, the community, being around the people, the games. I just didn't like writing 50 page papers. I didn't like uh, studying, memorizing something that was taught in August and having to memorize it all the way into uh, uh, May on a final. Like, like I just it was a lot of work and like and I went to a smaller school so I actually had to do all my work I had to do all my readings I had to do all like I didn't I didn't play with the blue bloods where I was taking a bull major and somebody's doing my work for me like mm. I went to Goshen College like mm. classroom size was like 25 or less 30 or less mm. teacher knew everybody by the name if you didn't show up to class there was they points know. deductions yeah. like they know <laughs> yeah, they so, know. Like, yeah. so I was in the grind yeah. and doing the work Mm. four-time all-american putting all this time in the court trying to be a good student you know mm. doing everything and mm. you know for me it was just like all right you got two options you can transfer um but you're not guaranteed of anything you're gonna have to sit out an entire year and that's one one year later to the money mm. this is how i was thinking i was mm. like or you can get your degree it's a great education great mm. um background you'll be able to work wherever you want because i always have a contingency plan you know, you never know how basketball can go. Maybe it doesn't work out for you overseas or in the league. Maybe you get injured. Maybe anything can happen. So, like, I always wanted to have that degree. and I had that. And that was instilled upon me with, with, by my parents. And so um, I just thought, like, if I go and I just break every record and I just dominate and I can't just play good, I got to play so good. It looks like I don't belong here. Like, I want people to be like, Goshen, why, why he there? where's that like and I thought like I'm about to put the school on the map I'm gonna let the school be known mm-hmm. and and if I'm good enough they will find me and, and that was kind of my mindset as a freshman and then my senior year that was kind of my mindset like yo this is it put everything into it you either gonna have a good job working a nine to five mm-hmm. um, with your business degree mm-hmm. or you're gonna be bouncing this ball for a living but we're gonna find out we're gonna put everything into it and we're gonna see and, mm-hmm. and that's kind of just my mindset, how it went. Like, I didn't think I was guaranteed to be pro. Like mm-hmm. there was barely any pros coming from the NAI division two. So like, mm-hmm. like I was taught to be realistic, but to set your goals and your dreams and to be mm-hmm. ready for, for any scenario. Did you track your brother through college as well? Like, cause you know, he was, you, you were in college and then he went to Lehigh, right? So you guys kind of went two different directions. Yeah. Did you, did you track them all through? Cause I remember, um, I watched uh, the Duke game because I think that's when he got on the map. That Duke game, mm-hmm. he had 30. So yeah. I, I remember that game vividly. Me and my brother watched that game together. We heard about him, and then we was like, yo, we got to see this game. He liked that. We go see what's popping. Then on Duke, he just went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he just went crazy. And, you know, NC, like um, Duke, North Carolina, like NC is die hard. Like, you know, with like Duke, UNC. I'm currently at State. I'm a junior right now. Um, they're like diehard fans, but like what the, what he did to Duke was so disrespectful. Oh yeah, he cooked you know, him. He cooked he him. Cooked Duke. I know he leaned on you a lot all through college. Uh, what was kind of like those convos, like you know, yeah, like it was important. You. So like, and um, and the thing that was nice is that when I went to college, um, they let me go home every summer because that was a big thing for me. Like I was, I need to be there for my brother. You know, he, he's three and a half years younger than me. I need to be, you know, a good influence on him. I need to make sure he's not around the wrong people. And I need to, you know, make sure he's getting his work in. So, like, they let me go home because they knew my professionalism. They knew how I work, how I train. It wasn't a big deal. Um, I took, like, a, a, a May term class, which was just something to give me extra credits, you know, to kind of push me to where I was trying to go. But in the summertime, like, I wasn't on campus working out. I was at home working out. And I was with my brother. And so, like, I was just basically hoping to, you know, everything that I might have did wrong or everything I didn't do, I wanted to make sure he didn't make those same mistakes. So he played AAU. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was whatever they said I didn't have, we were working on that. And they said for me, they just said that I had a division one game, but I didn't have a division one body. They said mm-hmm. you're a division one player, but we don't know if you can handle the physicality. So like we was working on everything with him to kind of make sure that, you know, he was there to have those things. And I know that, you know, some things your body type is your body type. Like you mm-hmm. can put some work in, but like Everybody yeah, can't be yeah. LeBron James body or, you know, it's just yeah. how it is. Like, yeah, that's fine. And so, that's fine. but, but I made sure that like he understood things and, and it was good because I had a younger brother. There were certain things that maybe if I was by myself, I might've protected him, but I didn't do because I knew whatever I did, he would follow. I knew mm-hmm. if I, if I made a decision to do drugs or alcohol, I knew he would, you know, mm-hmm. cause he looked up to me. I knew if I played 
video games more than I worked out. I knew he would do that. And so, like, constantly understanding that I was basically the person who um, who set the tone. And so whatever I did, that would be the norm. If I worked out in the morning before school, school started at 8, we in the gym working out 6.30, shower at the school. Like, for him, that was normal. That's all he seen. You know what I'm saying? And so mm-hmm. um, I carried on. In college, um, I was a senior, uh, or I was a junior, and uh, he was a senior in uh, high school. I was a junior in college. And mm-hmm. so, like, I'm going back, checking on him, making sure he's good, everything. And then my, my senior year, um, it was his freshman year, I think, uh, freshman year of college, yeah. And that's when he was, um, you know, starting to merge into the scene. He was an All-American as a freshman. Uh, he was a conference uh, player of the year. They made it to the tournament. He dropped 26 on Kansas. And so, like, they got popped. But, like, you started to see, like, he was legit. Mm-hmm. And I was able to kind of watch everything. And he would come visit me um, on spring breaks and stuff, like, and work mm-hmm. out everything. Mm-hmm. And um, once I got overseas, I was always constantly watching his games, making sure he was good. He was watching my games. And, you know, we had that relationship. It's not just, like, a brother. It's, it's a best friend relationship. And, you know, to this day, we still lean on each other. We still work out together. And, you know, we still push each other. So after you graduated, you went overseas. Um, how did how did you get that first overseas contract? I know you had to hire agency, obviously, but like, how did yeah. that whole process go? After the college season ended, um, mm. you know, I, I was all American first team. I was like one of the top scorers in the country. Like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Maybe I was <laughs> second, third, fourth. I don't know, but I was yeah. up there. I'm wondering, like, what's next? Mm. Like, what, what am I supposed to do now? And I want to play overseas, but I have no idea how to get there, how to go about that. Like, so for like a week, I didn't hear anything. And I was doing an internship because it was required um, for graduation mm-hmm. and just a couple of days a week. And they offered me a job and it was a steady job, you know, working um, in a uh, human resource department under the um, human resource president. Um, it basically, was like a, a nursing home. And I was in charge of like tallying and payrolls, insurances, health stuff. Like when people call off work, they got to go through me like basically I was a lot of spreadsheets excel stuff running through everything and they had offered me like good job 22 years old they offered me like making like 50k a year in um indiana low cost of living like so i didn't know what was next i was like i guess i'm gonna be working and then like two weeks after the season finally ended yeah. after like not hearing nothing it was like a, a plethora of agents to started reaching out to me my coaches and, and then i had to go through that process and that's when i decided on my agent and i, I chose right I've had mm-hmm. the same agent since I first came out. We've been 12 years strong. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he had seen me just because um, my senior year, I had uh, made ESPN top 10. Mm-hmm. And um, somebody tried to take a charge on me, and I just jumped over and dunked on him. I think I've seen that. And it was all over ESPN. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> I, I will find that clip, but I definitely see that. I yeah, will find that so clip. My, at it. my agent, my agent seen it. At the time, he was just... I don't know who he was. He didn't know who I was, yeah. but he um, was going through and he was like, man, who's this guy? And he said, he just happened to be, he said, he's seen athleticism. So he clicked on my name, searched me. And he said, my statistics were just insane. He was like, this guy has to be able to play like these numbers. He's like, I've mm-hmm. never seen him play, but he has been able to play. Then he found out that um, he was a Bucknell guy mm-hmm. and, and he graduated from Bucknell. He hooped at Bucknell. And at mm-hmm. this time, CJ, I just finished his freshman year and he was like maybe maybe he gotta be the hoop his brother was was good his numbers are crazy i don't really know the level um of d2 and ai but like yeah. anybody who averaging like 26 27 points a game <laughs> you know they gotta be pretty good and then he seemed yeah. like and, and he was trying to put the pieces together yeah. and then after talking with him i got a good vibe with him i had he was honest with me. You know, he answered my questions. He set the realistic expectations. Mm. Then I was like, okay, now this is a route. I'm going to go. I chose him. Mm. And um, all the teams loved my film. Like, mm. he's, he's seen my film. All the teams, they was like, yo, this kid can play. Mm. They, the problem is, how do you evaluate a kid that averages 26 or 27 points a game mm. at Goshen College and then a kid at, let's say, North Carolina, Duke, or House State who averages – eight to 10 points a game Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like and i think it was very difficult for those schools like dang is this kid at michigan state who averaged 11 Mm -hmm. nice Mm -hmm. or is aaron mccullen who had 27 at a school i've never heard of who's never played on espn like Mm -hmm. like and so they don't know how to how to i guess compare that or how to digest it so my agent had an idea and he's all right there's um uh, a showcase 
in Vegas. And at mm-hmm. this time, it was a good showcase. I don't know. Some of it might be watered down now. You got to remember, I'm 12 years in the game. So, mm-hmm. and, you know, things change. <laughs> so I want people to think you go to Vegas, you're automatically going to be cool. No, nah, like every showcase ain't a good showcase. Yeah. But this showcase particularly was a good one because my agent had teams already coming because they were there for summer league. It happened the same weekend or week of summer league. Mm-hmm. So all the overseas scouts, all the G League, like everybody is – in um vegas to watch you know nba summer league but mm. nba summer league isn't until the evening time like late afternoon i think like the game start at like four three mm. and, and later so mm. this camp was in the morning so so from like nine to like two mm. and everybody's guaranteed equal playing time um 10 players a team everybody plays 20 minutes you sub five minutes five minutes etc i was the only non-division one player there and everybody else was division one. And my agent was like, all right. He's like, this is the first time he's going to see me live. Mm-hmm. He had seen me. He flew me out to Vegas, paid for my hotel, paid for the little showcase and had guys come up and, and watch the game. And he said, look, I need you to dunk everything crazy <laughs> in warmups. He's like, during warmups, I'm going to be talking to the scouts. Cause I'm like, why bro? Like I ain't trying to waste my energy. He said, no, I'm going to be talking to all the scouts that I had come here. All the people from overseas. Like I got like four or five teams that I know are interested he said, I need you to just do all your dunks. And at this time, like, I was extremely athletic, like, through the legs, windmills, 360s, like, everything. He's like, and so when you're doing the dunking, it's going to be easy for me to be like, hey, that guy right there. Now they see that, they're going to be intrigued by your athleticism. You know how the NBA is. You know yeah. how he sees this. Like, oh, <laughs> like, you see a guard <laughs> bounce you with it. Like, you know, they're getting a little bit happy. Yeah. And so yeah. that kind of put the antennas up for them. They see me in warm-ups going crazy. And then the game started, and now they watching. And um, I, I was, like, the leading scorer the entire event. And, like, my agent, he was smart. Um, he basically, on uh, all the clips, he would clip it, and the person guarding me, he would um, tag their name, tag their school, Division oh, One. Oh, that's a smart, yo. Okay. So now smart, it's yeah. like, is Eric good enough to play D1? I don't know. Or Eric <laughs> good enough to play at uh, overseas? I don't know. You tell me. This yeah. guy went to um, – such and such school in the Big Ten Division One. Boom! Here's his stats. Yeah. Let's watch the game. Boom! So they're getting the clips, they're getting the highlights, they're seeing that stuff, and so now that just basically legitimized me as yeah. a guy who didn't just tear up smaller, lower level competition. He went yeah. to a showcase, which this is the best of the best, and towed him up too. And so there was like maybe four or five games, and like yeah. I think my first game I had like twenty seven and twenty minutes, and then I had like. 25 and 20 like i was just like i was locked in i was focused and i had a lot to prove and from there that propelled me to a job in israel um in the first league and once again i was the only non-division one player at the you know, yeah, first yeah. League so how was your experience there uh, playing in israel i was i know that yeah. lead that lead's good at the the lead yes uh, the israeli is no joke like people don't that that lead is good man i recommend all young players um, if you're starting your career out, it's a perfect place to go because it's an up-tempo lead. It's fast place. They rely heavily on foreigners, on mm-hmm. Americans, mm-hmm. and um, everybody speaks English. Mm-hmm. It's like living in Miami. Food is awesome. Israeli people are great. Like, I, I really enjoyed it there. Like, it was one of my, I think it's the best place I've ever played in, um, like, off the court, like, living, everything. And it's a place where, as a young player, you can go and show yourself and not have an extreme culture shock off the court or like a culture shop on the court because a lot of countries have different styles of play different tempos different strategies but this is a place that's about as americanized as it gets when it comes to basketball on the court up tempo free flowing um isolation all those type of things and you know i I just really loved it um things didn't go right the first year on the court for me uh, Mm um just because like i was the youngest i was the lowest paid and i I didn't really have that, that rep and so I don't feel like I was given, you know, fair opportunity minutes wise. And when I did get the minutes, I did something with it. But this is like the growing pains of Europe. You know, young players sometimes don't get an opportunity early. And um, I think it just made me more hungry, made me work even harder as a game, as you play overseas, even guys in the NBA. My brother didn't play his first two years in the NBA. Was he good enough to play? Of course. You don't just wake up one day and now you're a max player. Or you're a guy who's made 100 million. Like you've been yeah. that guy. You it's just didn't fun. get an opportunity. Like, and, and that was kind of the situation for me as well. So were, were you able to go to his, um, cause he was a lottery pick, right? He yes, was, he, he yes. was the first round 10th pick in 2013, yep. I believe 2013. Yep. Mm-hmm. Cause he's turning, he, he CJ should be 30 now. 
Yep. I think he's yeah. 30, yeah. Yeah, so you're cool. good, man. You're good. Yeah. You're <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to that draft night when he was drafted? Yeah. I how how was that? that? Oh, it was incredible. Like, it was one of the happiest moments of my life. So, like, mm -hmm. a lot of times people try to pin you against your brother or they think civil rivalry, but, like, the way me and my brother operate is what's mine is yours. What's yours mm -hmm. is mine. Like, people understand, like, whatever he needed, you know, he had it. I got it for him. Like, if, or my parents got it for him. You know, he in college, he called me. I'm already pro. I, I got a little bit of money. He, like, I need this. I need that. Here, it's yours. You know, mm -hmm. like, um, we're such a close-knit family that, you know, each person's individual success becomes our success. Like, that's how we are. We happy because you not only represent yourself, the hard work you put in, but you put in the family in a good light. You know, you represent everything well, like, and, you know, just to see everything he had to overcome, you know, knowing he took a similar path as me, seeing all the obstacles he faced, you know, to see that moment, a kid from Canton, Ohio, mm -hmm. you know, who, who had no stars, who had barely any offers, you know, who everybody, no one thought we would play professional. Like no one thought we would become, you know, who we are now. Like to see that, you know, come to Patricia, like it was just, it was extremely special and humbling. And it just shows you, you know, the blessings from God. If you put the work in, you know, he will reward you. Well, some of the um, growing pains he experienced, you had your fair share. I think it's, um, I think it's kind of cool. Like you had your, your growing pains, you know, early on. What was some growing pains he experienced in the lead? Because I'm Man. sure you guys spoke about that. Yeah, in the lead, it was crazy. Um, You know, you 10th pick in the draft. Um, You know, you're just coming off a broken foot. Like he was having an incredible year and he still got drafted 10th after missing uh 60 percent of the season um and so he comes in he looks great and training camp he's playing great um minutes um are, are there in the preseason and then he um breaks his foot and it's like dang like he you know he's stressed this is the second time he's broke his foot um you know he was just starting to get into rotation and kind of taken away and so he has to build that back up and, you know, in the NBA, when you're a young player and you're on the team that's in win now mode. And at this time, Portland had Nick Batum, Robert Lopez, LaMarcus Aldridge, Dane, Wes Matthews, you know, all extremely talented players. They were always a playoff team. They're not going to slow down and wait for you. So, you know, you miss that time. You come back in, it's hard to get back in the mix, regardless of your talent or your lottery. Like, they flow in. Mm -hmm. And you're a young player and you get a coach who doesn't like to play young players. You know, maybe it's just because he wants them to earn it. Maybe he doesn't trust young guys, whatever the case may be. A young player didn't usually play in the Portland system unless um, there was an injury or they were forced to. You know, with Dame, there was nobody else. You know, he had to play. Um, you know, my brother didn't play. Gary Trent didn't play. Will Barton didn't play. You know, these are all extremely talented players. Will Barton, over 40 million in Denver. Gary Trent signed a big deal, what, yeah. 70 million in, in Toronto. Like, yeah. these guys who were just on the end of the bench, not because mm -hmm. they weren't good enough, just because they were young. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he's battling that. And it's funny because um, when I had some time in the summertime, I would come down, you know, work out with the guys and, and, you know, just, you know, spend some time with my brother. And, you know, while I'm down, I need to work out, stay in shape, man. You know, I'll never forget this. I think it was CJ's first or second year, mm -hmm. uh, Wesley Matthews was like he was talking to me and he said man he said your brother's the real deal mm -hmm. i was like i was like yeah but he don't even play man like you know, he said no no he gonna play he was like hey he's like your brother's nice i said i know bro like i know <laughs> he was like <laughs> he was like he was like no he, no you don't understand it he was like your brother nice like they gonna trade me in a couple years this, this is gonna be his show like he gonna be the starting two guard here i was like i was like you think so and he's like, oh, for sure. Like, he 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 dominates in practice. Like, and this is my brother's, like, first and second year. He's like, yo, he dominates. He's special. He has it. He was like, I'll be out of here in probably two years, three years, and it's going to be your brother's. And the fact that, like, you know, he still was willing trying to help my brother. He was still, you know, telling me that, you know, knowing I'm going to tell my brother just to kind of encourage him when he's going through his growing pains, you know, just show the type of person he was. You know, he was just a good dude. And, you know, he definitely looked out for my brother. I got love for Wes Matthews, you know, good brother. And and when you older and you mature, you didn't made your bread. You mm -hmm. didn't see how the game go. You didn't mm -hmm. took somebody's spot when you was a young, you know, Thundercat. You was coming out there. You didn't took somebody's spot. Like, yeah. no matter who you are, eventually your time comes. Unless you like KD or Brian, like, yeah. it's eventually gonna come. it's going to come. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so after, but after um, Israel, you went to Greece, right? 
I believe, yeah. um, right after Israel. I I two was, years Israel, and then I went to Greece. And you went to Greece. For me, yeah. that was that was awesome. I loved Greece. Um, it was kind of my coming out party, just mm-hmm. because I had played, you know, solid in Israel. Mm-hmm. But like Greece was such a respected league. They had two year league teams. They have that prestige, um, and it's a league that's known for a tactic. It's more half court. You know, you got to be, you know, dealing with the physicality, all the things that make it tough. Whereas mm-hmm. Israel was the exact opposite. It's up tempo, it's free flowing, like yeah. it's um, open gym like. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, I went there and, you know, I think I was the third leading scorer in the lead. And I kind of really made a name for myself and started to earn a lot of respect. And, you know, before you have it, I was, you know, regarded as, you know, in a, a legit um, Euro lead level type of guard. Did you go, you went to China right after that? Like after, after Greece? I did, you went to China? I did another year in Greece. Yeah. Um, and then um, after that year in Greece, I got um, I was a leading scorer in Greece, leading scorer in the Euro Cup, MVP of the Greek League, and yeah. from there I went to China. Yeah, and then that's where you had the eighty-two point game. I heard you got a um, I read something that said you got an NBA offer out of that, and you refused to take it. Why the hell yeah. did you refuse to take it? At the time, uh, the Hawks had offered me, yeah. and um, the problem was Jeff T had just signed fifty million. They just drafted Dennis Schroeder. Mm-hmm. Um, he was early first round or like maybe mid first round or something. Mm-hmm. And then they wanted me to be the third point guard. And so they said that um, your role, you know, would be you would play after them. You wouldn't really get many minutes. It'd be a lot of DMPs. Um, mm-hmm. If one of them got hurt, you'd be thrust into the lineup. But, mm-hmm. you know, there wasn't a lot of minutes for you at this time. At this time, I think I was 25 or 26 years old. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so you're talking about eight to nine years ago. And I was like, man, what? And then also the minimum at that time um, in the NBA was uh, $469,000. Before which, taxes. Which is before taxes. So, oh, like, okay. people always think, like, NBA players make all this money. Mm-hmm. You know, at that point, that's a that's a really good doctor. You know, that's a solid lawyer. So, 469000 if you're in a state with, let's say, 50% tax, mm-hmm. you know, that four hundred, you know, shrinks into yeah. about you know 240 ish and then you got to pay your agent four percent of that 469 percent so like you know in china you know i had a seven figure offer mm-hmm. and so i'm like hold up hold up you want me <laughs> to take to take two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or less yeah to sit on the bench yeah to not play to watch and to hope somebody get hurt yeah or I didn't already built up my whole career in Europe and, and China. Like yeah. I have a name, you know, they pay me accordingly. Um, mm-hmm. They pay my agent fees, all types of stuff. So you, know, you asking me to take four times the salary pay cut <laughs> for no opportunity to play. How can I show that I'm an NBA player? How can I show that I deserve a contract to next year if I don't play? Who going to sign me if yeah. I'm third point guard and I don't play? Who going to sign me? Like, what do they have to watch? And so I decided, like, that wasn't the best move for my career, not only financially, but playing-wise. Like, I can give up money. Money isn't everything, but I need an opportunity to play. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 25, 26 years old. Like, playing is how you improve. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't even need a lot of minutes, like 12, 15 minutes a night. Mm -hmm. I can can make that work. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I can can get get busy with that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that wasn't the opportunity. So I, I declined the offer. Did you did you negotiate with them? Like, yo, is there any negotiation with those type of offers, or is like, yo, this is what it is? Like, you don't take it. On if you don't take team. it, they moving on to the next. Because as the third Damn. point guard, you don't hold that like that that bargaining tool. Your third point guard, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, you really ain't gonna play unless in case of emergency. And if you out there, that means like a key player is hurt. Yeah, yeah. And so like, mm-hmm. and that's just that's kind of how how it really rolls. Third point guard don't play. Mm. And so I had that was I had an opportunity and then another time um I had an opportunity after China mm. I actually you know was talking with the Clippers and uh CP3 had called my brother and mm. was like yo we need your brother blah blah he go and I was gonna be backup point guard and so mm. China at this time was a short season it finishes um in February mm. and it was perfect time and I had played from September to February mm. and just came off a great year and I was ready to go everything was lined up they started getting in the contracts together um everything was perfect and this is when they were lob city deandre jordan blake griffin jj reddick cp you know mm-hmm. cp you know they wanted to preserve his body they didn't want him out there playing 36 37 a night you know maybe put him at like 32 33 minutes and you have me coming in 
playing, you know, 15, 16 minutes a game. Mm-hmm. And I was cool with that. You know, I was like, all right, I can do that. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> everything was about to go through. Mm-hmm. And then, bam, Doc traded for his son. And um, Man. there was no spot for the point guard. He took the backup role. Yeah. And it was over. And those was the two opportunities um, I had early in my career, you know, to go to the NBA. Dang, man. And, yo, you never know. The Clippers thing would have went through. Man, man. probably you playing right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real, though. Like, for real. You probably <laughs> playing right now. For real. Dang, that's crazy. So, did you, um after China, you joined the, the Nuggets. No, you, in 2014, you, you joined the Nuggets Summer League team, right? You, yeah. you played in the Summer League. How was the Summer League experience? Uh, like, just, it's all, it was in Vegas in 20, it was, it's been in Vegas every year, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, so how yeah. was that experience out there? For me, it rubbed me the wrong way because um, during that summer, I had just got MVP in Greece and all the scoring titles and everything. And so all these teams wanted me to play summer league. And so mm-hmm. Denver had reached out first. Mm-hmm. And um, there's two summer leagues. There's one in Orlando and yeah. there's one in Vegas. And so yeah. I was just supposed to play in Vegas. And then the Houston Rockets reached out because I was doing mini camps in the summer. Like, mm-hmm. And so before summer league, I was going to all these different teams, working out, playing. Mm-hmm. And after they saw me and played everybody wanted me to play in their team after I did a mini camp with them they was like yo we want you to play on the summer league team and I was just being loyal like I already committed to Denver mm. I'm not available for that and Houston was like that's fine you can do Orlando with us mm. and um not do um uh not do Vegas with them do Vegas with us too mm. and I was like no nah, no nah, I can't do that I already committed <laughs> to them they was like all right just do Orlando with us and you can do Vegas with them and I said yeah. I was like okay and then I I told Denver I'm like yo I want to play you know, with Houston, they was like, oh, no, they made this big deal. Like, no, we need you to be at in Denver for a training camp, work out. You know, we want you to get in the flow. You're going to be playing 20 minutes a night, blah, blah, blah. But really, they just needed, um, and, you know, people. if they didn't have enough people show up to training camp, how can you really get a full practice? You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, if everybody is spaced out. So I didn't do it with Houston, and I would have had a big, I would have had a big role there. Everything would have been fine. Come Denver, Denver in that draft drafted, um, uh a guard in the first round it was gary harris Mm -hmm. and uh and um a guard in the second round the year before was eric green and Mm -hmm. so they played like they were playing like 30 38 40 minutes a game because Mm -hmm. they were on the roster rightfully so Mm -hmm. and but the thing is if you knew you wasn't gonna use me like i could why why you pick me up yeah why you pick me up why you lying to me just say just say like yo we got these guys on roster Mm -hmm. we gonna play them to the wheels fall out because we already under contract with you know, and so like I didn't even get to get an opportunity really to play. And mm. I was a little bit, you know, upset just because politically, just tell me the truth. Like, mm. you know, you can get anybody here to come training camp and you know to be, you know, a body or to give them a look or help push them. Mm. But like, don't tell me that. Like, you know, I had other opportunities that I could have taken advantage of. So like after that, I was done with some of the like the political part. I'm done. If you want me, I know what I do. I play mm. overseas, I kill every year. You want me? I'm here. I'm not doing none of that. Like after that, I said I'm not doing no workouts. I'm not doing um no um summer leagues. I'm not doing none of that. Like if you want me, it's you know me. what I do. Yeah. It's there, and that was just my mindset because I was li- making a good living overseas. I was happy. Mm-hmm. I was playing well, and I was cool with that. You transitioned to Turkey. I want I want to talk about the Turkey League because do you know um Ekbe Yuda? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you or do, yeah. oh, you know, you know, I'm not you know, you know, and I'm Nigerian. I mispronounced it. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Right? He go, he gonna get all me about that. But I, I did an interview <laughs> with him. I know he played a turkey. Um, he did his time there before going back to the Jazz. But um, like he he told me the the atmosphere in Turkey is like crazy. Like um, like the fan base is crazy. They they go yeah, crazy, unreal. So unreal. like how how what was your experience playing there? Because I know his was wild, but. We actually yeah. played on rival teams, like the biggest that, rivalry in yeah. Turkey. Yeah, yeah. So I went <laughs> yep. to Galatasaray, yeah. and he yeah. was at Fenerbahce. Yeah. And, I mean, when I tell you these fan bases hate each other, like, <laughs> I mean, there's SWAT team at the game, yeah. um, 100, like 100 SWAT team officers, maybe more, hundreds of officers, um, yeah. trying to separate these two fan bases. Um, yeah. They're trying to fight in the middle of the game. Like, we're on a court playing. Yeah, it's real right? smoke out there. Break out in the stand. You'll see like you'll see like a wave of like his team was uh blue and yellow. Our yeah. team was red. So you'll see like blue and red, and then you'll just see all this um black SWAT SWAT police officers like just trying to keep them um away from killing each other. Um Dang. they were throwing things on the court, 
yeah. spitting. I mean, all type of thing like that. Like I always joke. I said they have like uh, controlled flare flare guns. I don't know what it is, but they're like shooting like little flares out there. And, like oh no, nah. um, at the game. Like <laughs> after that, like my my yeah. wife. You know, she um when she would come to the games, like they check women's purses, they take all coins, all lighters, everything, because those can and will be used as a weapon at the game to throw at the opposing team. What? So, like, it was yeah. so bad. Like when we would play them or they would play us, the visitors bench has like a shield that protects it, and the shield protects your back, the sides, and above your head. And like when you look above the shield, like you'll see like coins lighters spit gloves like all nasty oh no nah. like, you ever got hit like, by one of them <laughs> oh man i got hit with some spit it was oh, disgusting nah. like, <laughs> so we're gonna have to see me about that <laughs> man, but well, the problem is, that. Like, you don't know where it came from there's ten thousand people in the stadium and then you on the road so like yeah. even if you do turn up it's ten thousand of them yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're, gonna get, no. you're gonna have to get one or two and get, and get to the tunnel quick <laughs> oh hell no nah. you gotta see me about that that's crazy <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. so, so it no was, wonder he it went back experience and they have drums they have all type of stuff so like like they it, it's not like the casual fan in the u.s who cheers when something happened i mean they got a chance they're screaming like i love playing mm-hmm. turkey it was fun but there was a couple of environments i was in where i was like yo this is a little unsafe yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> I've already know <laughs> you joined something called the overseas elite team, right? Was that that's oh, a yeah. that's an off season thing? Is yeah, that- so it was a tournament, um, the the TBT, the basketball tournament, and it was a money tournament. Okay, it's um, it was like the reward is like um two million or something like that, right? Yeah. So it yeah. was like so two million. I, yeah, when I played, um, I played from 2015 yeah. to 2018, so four years. Mm-hmm. And the first year of the tournament, it was one million. Yeah, and then um the second year, and third and fourth year, which would have been sixteen through eighteen, the mm-hmm. tournament was two million. Okay, and so uh, we we won it four four years in a row. Oh damn, a you got the bag on that. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got the bag on that. Damn, and did everyone yeah. get like a cup from? What was what was like each yeah. player's percentage? So like um, so the way the tournament worked is that it's winner take all. Uh, if you lose, oh. you're out. If yeah. you win. You advance, and so it's just like NCAA tournament format. It's open to everyone, yeah. Um, but you have to get voted in. Like you have to get a certain amount of fan votes to get in. It's just high stakes, you know. It's on ESPN, on ESPN two. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody is, um, you know, locked in, engaged, and you know how the split went. For we did it, we just did even cuts, mm-hmm. and so like um, I think we had maybe like nine, nine. I think we had ten players, um, and then uh, a GM and mm-hmm. a coach. And I think I think the first year I take was maybe like. Uh, 100k 107k or so and then Dang. i think the second year the take was and mind you it was like it was i think we went seven and oh mm-hmm. um and the second year the take was uh, like 150k mm-hmm. because it had increased and then the third year was like 175k and the last year was like maybe 200k and it was cool because it was just like for us it was summertime you know, it was like we like playing, we enjoyed playing, it was fun, and it was an opportunity for family who don't necessarily um get to see us play consistently just because we're overseas, we're abroad, like it's a far trip, travel, time difference, everything. This was a chance for them to get to see us play. I know you're um I know you're busy. I always ended off, always ask um five questions. Um when I when I ended off. Who who are your top five current artists right now, like in your book? My favorite artist is J. Cole. J. Cole, hands down. For sure. Next, Drake. Oh, yeah, yeah, like Drake. It. Like, you can't not like Drake. He's versatile with it. I like Future. I like Gunna. Gun- yeah, his album yeah. hard, yo. Yeah. His new album hard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> his new album yeah. go crazy. I was going to say, who's the best player you ever defended? But I saw, like, um, you were in New York training with Berkeley, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Not too long ago. Like, I saw, like, you and your brother going at it. Um, But who who's probably the best player you ever defended? Like ever, it could be overseas. It could be someone you train with. Be LeBron, just because we um he from Cleveland or he from Akron actually. But oh, you played playing, with LeBron. We, we was playing in a pro am in Cleveland. So oh, okay. I'm from Akron and I'm from Ken, and like I'm cool with Romeo Travis. Um, okay. Romeo played with LeBron in um in high school, and so there was a pro am in Cleveland. And when I was younger, like 23, 24, we used to all play in a pro am, and we were just running. Romeo played. Uh, 14 years overseas. Uh, Drew okay. Joyce, who was the point guard, 
you know, he played, I think, 12 years overseas. And then myself and Brown, I mean, we had a nasty squad. And then when yeah. CJ was in town, he would play too. And so, oh, that's I mean, tough. We won, it, we won the championship and stuff. So. <laughs> okay, CJ, but... <laughs> Brown, and you, what? <laughs> Man, that could win an NBA championship. <laughs> what? So, that's crazy. So we was back. That. So he the best, um, I'll play overseas. The best player I ever played against um, is Mike Beasley. Like, okay. I mean, him and Luka Dantich. I played it against Luka Dantich when he was 19. He was at Real Madrid. Man, okay. he was special then. He's special now. Nothing's changed. Like, how he doing mm-hmm. the lead is, you know, uh, kind of similar to how he um, dominated overseas as well. Mike Beasley, boy, that boy Cole, like, his talent-wise, Mike Beasley is up there. You know, he he's different. Yeah, for sure. When, when was that pro-am? How old? So, was, was CJ still in college when that happened or high school? Yeah, that, yeah. So, like, see. CJ was still in college. Okay. So, like, oh, so y'all been, you've been knowing Brown in a way then? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, when you play, you know, overseas and stuff or, you know, you do something professionally in your field, mm-hmm. you know, people know each other. Like, I didn't really knew, know that he knew what, who he was really until, like, you know, I, we met through, like, a mutual friend. Oh, okay. so, like, tough. Like, I guess whenever you our, – our cities are small. Like, Ken, Akron, where Brown's from, he's from 20 minutes from where I'm from. Mm-hmm. And so, like – you know, the basketball world is so small. You might not know someone, but you know of them. And then eventually you do cross paths. And, you know, and I did, you know, he, you know, good dude, man. Good dude. You know, he does a lot for the community, for the city. Um, he, I mean, he impacts the world. Like, he's so much more than just, you know, basketball. Even though he's one of the best ever to play, you know, as a person, just what he's doing, what he's accomplished. I mean, it's special. How long, how long you been training with Berkeley um, and, and why? Dude, my and our brother trains with him very often. And okay. so um in the off season, my brother's in New York a lot. He loves New York at the time. Um mm-hmm. his his uh wife uh was um at Columbia. Mm-hmm. And so in the off season, he would always spend all his time there. Mm-hmm. And he always used Brickley then and he likes Brickley. And I when I would go visit him just because I wanted to see him and you know, see his wife, you know, mm-hmm. and hang out with them. Mm-hmm. You know, I got some work in too. You know, he has a big clientele, you know, he you know, he cares a lot. He watches film, um, sees how your game is, you know, how you score or how you, you know, have success. And then he tailors his workouts to that. You know, I think that's important. A lot of people just, you know, give you generic workouts, but you need to know what somebody does, you know, how they successful, you know, what their team is looking for in them. And then, you know, do that. And he, he does that, he spends that time. So, you know, I definitely enjoy working out with him. It was cool. And, you know, definitely, um, you know, another, another twist. I'll just get this. I know you probably would get this out of the way. Uh, MJ LeBron, who you think the GOAT is? Because I was going to ask that. Then. <laughs> it's different because for me, it's MJ, but I think mm-hmm. it's because this is the generation I grew up with. Like for me, Brown was more of a peer. You mm-hmm. know, MJ was like, some, he's the reason why I started loving basketball so much. Him and Allen Iverson. Like, mm-hmm. so to me, like, ain't nobody like them. Like, yeah. And it ain't, like, it's just my opinion. Like, they changed the game. Mm-hmm. Um, shit, Michael Jordan basically saved the NBA. Allen mm-hmm. Iverson changed the culture. You know, and to me, those two are my favorite players. But if I got to choose between Brian and Jordan, you know, you know, Brian's my how guy. You know, I love Brian's game. I think he's one of the best ever. But you know, I gotta go with Jordan. All right, this one's kind of tough. All right, if you if you drop, um, you know, the 07 team Brian uh, led to the finals, the Cavs, like Larry Hughes. Not saying oh, yeah. they bad players. Not saying Sasha they bad Pavlovich. players. Yeah, those yeah. guys. Not saying they bad players. But if you drop Jordan on that team, you switch LeBron and Jordan out. Does that team go to the finals still? I don't think that team makes the finals mm-hmm. because it's just not enough power power. Like, mm-hmm. It's just not enough. And mm-hmm. I don't even know how LeBron made the finals with them, to be honest, because mm-hmm. they, they were, they were <laughs> not for real. overmatched. Like, yeah, that's not impressive. for real. Like, LeBron for real. getting that team to the finals is very impressive. Not that those yeah. guys aren't good. It's just that other teams were just better. Yeah. But he just went crazy um, in that series. Um what, he beat the Pistons. Yeah, I don't think he knows how he got to the finals. Yeah. Like, cause like. I, he, he be in disbelief. If you watch his post game interviews and they ask him, "Did you know?" He he be looking like, "Did you know?" Like when he like scored know? or assisted on like thirty straight points. Like, uh, that's insane. At a point, you can only use strictly Ohio players, strictly. So you and you could use Steph Curry since he was born in Akron. Yeah, so, I was gonna say. Yeah, a lot like, of people don't know that. You could you could use Steph Curry strictly Ohio players. What starting five are you taking to play the 96 Bulls? Only Ohio. No, only Ohio. No other state. Only Ohio. Got to go Steph Curry. Okay. CJ. CJ at the two. Okay. CJ at the two or Steph at the two? CJ at the two. CJ at the two. And then, okay. 
LeBron. LeBron, okay. Ooh, and this one gets tricky. We need some size, huh? There's a lot of town out of Ohio, man. Yeah, but we need size now. I got to yeah. give us, you know, for the 96 Bulls, you know, you're talking about Luke Longley, I got to give Big Fella in there, Costa Kufis. Got to have okay. a body in there, match the size. Give okay. Luke Longley some problems, get us some boards. Okay. Um, and then at the four, who would I like? Uh, hey, you can move Braun to the four. I could move Brown to the four. <laughs> Might, maybe I just move Brown to the four and then maybe go Michael Red. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fact. Go- hey, I don't think the Bulls, I don't know if they could defend the shooting that well. Yeah, know, so we're going to go like, Steph, so. CJ, Michael Red, Brian, and Costa. That, that's a pretty good pretty That's good a pretty good right lineup. There. That's not <laughs> boy, man. I know you got to go, man. I will let you go. This is a great interview. Man, y'all uh, like, subscribe to YouTube channel. Appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you having me, brother. No problem.